Hello, everybody, and welcome to our episode today where we're going to be talking about Rasputin and a cult that developed around one of his body parts. With that being said, before we get into this episode today, I do want to let you guys know that in this episode, we are going to be talking about very, very adult topics, especially topics regarding intimacy. And I know that a lot of you guys, or I've gotten a lot of emails, amazing emails from you guys telling me that you use my um, deep dives as history lessons for your kids that you are homeschooling. And so to be fair to you guys, to the awesome parents out there, as well as to the young little ears that might be listening, this might not be an episode that you want to expose your children to quite yet, um, depending on their age. Of course, obviously, that is absolutely up to you as a parent. But I just wanted to do my due diligence and let you guys know that the, to the topic of conversation, the main topic of conversation in this deep dive is probably not appropriate for young children. Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. I was born in 1983. With that being said, I grew up with a lot of music being played in my household from bands that were big in mostly the 70s. That is because my parents were young adults in the 70s. I know how to work a record player, and I feel like my trivia when it comes to music from that time period is, is pretty good. With that being said, a few years ago, a song went viral. This was a song titled Rasputin, and it allegedly is a song from 1978. The only problem is that a lot of the people that I know, including my parents, who were alive and living culturally during the 70s don't remember this song. According to Wikipedia, Rasputin is a song by the German-based pop and Euro disco group Boney M or Bonnie M, not quite sure how they say that properly. It was released on the 28th of August 1978 as the second single from their third studio album, Night Flight to Venus, which again dropped in 1978. Written by the group's creator, Frank Farron, along with George Riem and Fred J., it is a song about Gregory Rasputin, a friend and advisor to Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and his family during the early 20th century. The song describes Rasputin as a playboy, mystical hero, and political manipulator. Now, it's a quite catchy song. I do have it on my playlist because it is, again, very, very catchy. But for the last few years, I've been contemplating on how strange it is that no one from this time period seems to actually remember this song, this song that apparently was a hit back in the late 70s. So I did a little searching to see if there's a reasonable explanation as to why this song all of a sudden is going viral when, again, no one from that time period actually remembers it. And of course, according to the internet, the song Rasputin was in fact an international hit when it first came out. Again, even though no one can remember it. But it gained traction, allegedly, in the early 2000s by a video game that was popular in the early 2000s called Just Dance. I absolutely remember this game. And then it also gained traction again through TikTok, as of recently, through dance numbers choreographed on the application. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit the subscribe button and the like button. Thank you again to all of our patrons and our producers on this channel. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. You guys are amazing. If you would like to join our Patreon and our producer community, the link is down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, 
we're going to be talking about the weird cult that surrounds Rasputin's intimate body part. Grigory Rasputin was born on the 21st of January 1869 and died on the 30th of December 1916. Rasputin was born to a very poor family, to peasants out in the land of Siberia. And in this time period in Siberia, especially in the late 19th century, moving into the 20th century and into what was called the Cold War, Siberia was kind of this like dumping ground for many people. The lifestyle of people in Siberia was very different than what you would find in more Western Russia. As I was studying Siberia at this time, I actually wrote in my notes that this was like the wild, wild west. And then I heard another professor also refer to it as the wild, wild west except it's the wild wild east this is a very very hard terrain to live on it's a very hostile land it's a very cold land and because this was kind of a dumping ground for the misfits of Russian society, you had a lot of mysticism, a lot of spiritual healers. It was kind of a free-for-all when it came to religious practices. You have to also consider that because of the geographical location of Siberia, the approved Orthodox Russian church did not have as much of a reach in this area as it would have in more Western Western Russia. With that being said, there were still what we consider to be pagan practices going on in Siberia. Now, just to clarify, pagan is a word that was invented by the church to basically describe any practice that wasn't in alignment with the governing body of the organization, the business of the Christian church. So just calling some practices pagan doesn't necessarily mean they were bad. In fact, most of them were more natural nature based. Most of them were pretty much in alignment with the um, workings of God, in my opinion. But with that being said, it did create quite an open environment for people to experiment however they pleased in their own religious life in Siberia. Siberia was also known to have many secret societies based around the occult. And this is going to become very important as Rasputin starts to get older and starts to really come become the man that he became historically. Even though Rasputin was known to have visions and to be able to heal the sick, he was also feared by many of the locals he grew up with because they feared that there was a wickedness within him. This is probably because at a very young age, Rasputin was known to be a raging alcoholic and a troublemaker. Not saying that alcoholics are wicked. I just believe that from what I read and from what I studied about his young life, for him, his alcoholism caused him to act out in very aggressive ways. Once again, Rasputin was not only known to heal horses. Horses were very important animals in Siberia at this time. Um, it did the harshness of, of the environment, the pulling of wagons, the pulling of produce. Horses were so valuable to, to humans living in Siberia. And so he, again, he had this reputation of being able to use Reiki to heal horses. But my friends, he also developed a reputation of, um, stealing horses. He was a horse thief, and this was a very, very serious crime. By the age of 30, Rasputin was married and was the father of four children. We will actually learn more about one of his daughters, Maria, later on in this deep dive. But at 30, with four children, four mouths to feed, and a wife living in very poor circumstances, Rasputin got himself into so much trouble from horse 
thiefing that he ran to a monastery for protection. We see this throughout history that in a lot of cases, churches or sanctuaries, monasteries were seen as kind of home based because even at this time, historically speaking, monasteries, churches were kind of seen off limits by both sides. And so Rasputin found himself hiding out in a monastery. At this time, Rasputin ended up spending a few months hiding out in this monastery where he had what can be described as a religious experience. Through learning all the rituals and the customs of the Orthodox Russian faith, Rasputin discovered that he had even more mystical gifts and abilities. It was also here that he first became aware that the Tsar and the Tsarina, basically the emperors of Russia throughout history, that it was commonplace for the rulers to have their own healer and mystic at their palace in St. Petersburg. At this time, St. Petersburg was the capital of Russia. And this is a very important seed that was planted in Rasputin's mind. But nonetheless, at this point, Rasputin decides to leave the monastery to go on a pilgrimage around Russia and down to the quote-unquote holy land. He himself believed he was, in fact, a quote-unquote holy man, which is definitely our first indication that this person is on a service to self or a negative path. On the path of light, even though some people might be more, might be further along in their spiritual journey, no one on the, 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 the side of light considers themselves to be any more elite than anybody else, especially in the eyes of God. In fact, elitism or anything involving a pecking order is a sign of sat Satanism or darkness, a negative po polarity. So our whole system that we're in right now with royalty, with prophets and priests, people claiming to speak for God, that is is all signs of the service to self or negative polarity. So for me, knowing the law of one, this is the first real red flag that we see of Rasputin. We know that he was born with certain gifts and certain abilities as far as understanding mysticism and spirituality. But what he does with these gifts and abilities is going to determine the outcome of his soul. He is a sold person that the law of one does say this. Again, we'll get to that at the end of this video, but he is making very selfish choices at this moment. Another selfish choice that he has made is to abandon his wife and children to go on this pilgrimage, putting himself and his needs above that of the people who are dependent upon him to basically eat. Again, these are peasants. These are not people that are in the upper bourgeoisie or middle class of Russia. These are people that are literally living paycheck to paycheck in a time where women on their own potentially aren't able to make the same amount of money as their husbands. I have a lot of empathy for his wife, um, and I have a lot of respect for her that she basically ended up being a single mother for most of her life while Rasputin was running around serving only his selfish desires. During Rasputin's pilgrimage, he spent long, many months just wandering around all over the wilderness. He, it is said he wouldn't bathe. And so he had a very pungent smell. You could like smell him coming, which is so disgusting to me. Oh, I cannot handle that. But anyway, he would go on these really long meditations, which I have spoken about this before. If you're new to my channel, I am the only female in the state of Georgia to carry a particular authorization from KPJYI in India. I know a lot about meditation, and I also know a lot about how meditation can cause psychosis and neurosis. Um, for Rasputin, I don't actually believe it caused psychosis because I do believe he did have abilities. I just believe to use them for for bad. But basically, a lot of people misunderstand meditation. It is not okay. It is not good for you to have long periods of medi seated meditation. It can bring the mind into a place of derangement and delusions. Now, if you are going away to an ashram for a very short amount of time, that's one thing. But on a daily basis, your meditation should only be about 15 minutes max, because you don't want to fall into the world of your imagination or your ego. And so this to me was a red flag too. When I I saw that Rasputin had spent all this time meditating. I thought, well, great. Okay, so we're, we're getting somebody who's obviously very unhinged at this point. Although I do believe 
from what the law of one says, which again, will get to you, that he knew what he was doing. He was going into some wicked, dark places. It is said that he actually walked all the way to Greece. He tried to get to the actual holy land. And at this point, this makes sense to me because he does discover or come upon a group, uh, a secret organization, an occultist based group that is illegal in Russia at this time called the Kalist. And I don't know if I'm saying that right. It, it basically is a, a Russian word that means a whip. Now, the, the practices and the antics of this secret organization very much remind me of the Dionysian cult, which we have talked about to great extent on this channel. I will link that video down in the description box below if you missed it. Basically, the Dionysian cult is the cult of Christianity today. It is the cult of Zeus and Dionysus, which is where we get the name Jesus from which is of Zeus or of Satan, um, when his real name was actually Yeshua and he was never crucified. So the Dionysian cult is the basis of Christianity. And this, this particular secret sect that Rasputin got wrapped up into took the Dionysian cult and basically reenacted it to the T, including they would whip themselves, they would drink to excess to bring in demonic spirits, they would have massive, massive orgies, they even um, participated in cannibalism where they would chop off the breast of a virgin and eat the breast of a virgin. This makes sense to me again because of what the Law of One has say stated. I keep teasing that towards the end, but I just want you to remember these things because this is very, very indicative of somebody who is consciously aware of going negative. After his pilgrimage and his involvement in these Dionysian, modern day Dionysian cults, Rasputin does return back to Siberia. At this point, he has gone full on cult leader in the sense where he is now calling himself the only place for a divine source. So he thinks he is the only human on the planet that carries a divine source energy. This is terrifying to me. There are people on Telegram claiming this as well. There is a woman on Telegram claiming to be Tesla's great niece. And she herself has many times claimed to be God on earth and that she herself alone speaks to God. These are all signs of demonic activity or negative polarity service to self polarity but nonetheless Rasputin comes back he's walking around like he is a godsend literally to planet earth he opens up a chapel underneath his house like in his basement right and he decides this chapel turns more into like a sex dungeon he believes that it is imperative for his follower followers to sleep with him in order to generate the divine source of god for them themselves. Now, I know a lot of people are going to compare this to tantric yoga. The two are not the same. In the tantric practices of yoga, you are, you are instructed to have one partner. That's it. One partner. In fact, in most of Indian culture, it is very scandalous to have ever in your life to have more than one partner and so this is again sex can be a very spiritual thing with your beloved we've seen this in the magdalene manuscript we've seen this in a lot of the missing books of the bible but stolen from the darkness and inverted it becomes something of like wicked sadism with um orgies and and um cannibalism and extreme violence and so this is where again we see this inversion but because Rasputin does have the ability to do some pretty mystical things like heal people and see visions predict the future people are now believing his bullshit basically and so they're kind of becoming smitten by this stinky stinky man I mean gross um and basically he's just a nymphomaniac like having sex all day with all these different people some accounts say it was only women he was sleeping with while others say he would engage in homosexuality doesn't really matter to me what matters to me is, is he was inverting people using people and gaining power from people's submission at this point Rasputin was becoming a bit larger than life his celebrity 
status, you could say at this point, was kind of spreading all over Russia. And at this point, he was starting to get some aristocrats, some upper class people traveling out to Siberia to visit Rasputin. So he's starting to get a taste for the good life, you know, for these wealthier people that live on the western side of, of Russia near St. Petersburg, closer to U continental Europe. At this point, Rasputin believes or claims that the Virgin Mary came to him and told him specifically that his job was to be the minister or the healer for the current Tsar and Tsarina of Russia. This, of course, was Tsar Nicholas II and his wife, Alexandria or Alex of Hesse. This, of course, was the very famous family with Anastasia, which we'll cover her in a totally separate video that ended up getting executed by the Bolshevik before the, at, the, at, the, at the onset of the Russian Revolution. At the age of 34, Rasputin decides to travel the 1,600 miles to St. Petersburg. By 1903, Rasputin was the talk of the town. He was now living in St. Petersburg. I, I, I would have to imagine it would not just be the fact that he literally could do things for people. He could do mystical things for people, but just probably the sight of him, too, gave more uh, enigma to his character, the fact that he was stinky, that he did not, uh, as as our reports say, he he did not um, kiss ass to the aristocrats. In fact, he kind of treated the aristocrats like they were beneath him. Um, he used informal language with the aristocrats. And so people were just spellbound by him. And I do personally believe he probably was involved in some black magic, casting some spells and stuff, but there's no, there's no real proof of that. Although we do know he did dabble in occultism. That's just my own speculation that it wasn't just his charisma that um, attracted aristocrats to him but probably there was probably a little something else happening behind closed doors with some spells that that again just just my opinion there the late 1800s and the early 1900s did bring about a lot of spiritualism across the world we've covered this before with other cases i will put some of those videos down in the description box below but people were really playing with with the occult right they were doing seances so people were very mystical they believed in ghosts they were trying to contact their loved ones this was a very fascinating time in our history as as humanity um just you know even people who were churchgoers were, were doing seances at night to speak to grandma and grandpa i mean this is just really really fascinating so with that being said his abilities by a lot of people were not dubious or suspicious they literally truly believed culturally that that these things were possible that people could do this and they also the eastern russian people also had a very open um acceptance of sex this is something that i did not know until i started to research Rasputin more now we know throughout like aristocratic families and royal courts that marriage and love oftentimes are two different things we know that it was very commonplace for kings to have mistresses they would have their queens that were assigned to them because of a particular bloodline they were trying to preserve but they would have their girls on the side so it was very common in, in, in any type of aristocratic family not just the royals that marriages were more political than passionate and so of course people had lovers on the side now again this was more common for men especially the closer you were to the monarchy because the woman needed to be responsible for carrying the child of the king there needed to be no hesitation of whose father the child was but nonetheless with all of this being said for people to have affairs or to sleep with people that weren't their spouses was very common in this in the, these worlds of of aristocrats and so his sexual appetite was not super strange for the russians in saint petersburg it, it might be a little bit more shocking to us today but back then it wasn't that shocking and so very, very quickly, Rasputin developed a bit of a harem of, of aristocratic women that would just come in and out of his house and would basically be intimate with him. And all of a sudden, their issues 
would would be settled now it is common at this time for women to be diagnosed with something called hysteria which goes back to this idea that a woman is not being um fulfilled intimately by her husband and so it would cause women to kind of get migraines and a lot of times doctors especially in america would throw women into mental institutions for this when it literally a hysteria in my opinion was more of a psychological and biological response to not being loved or not having passion and so rasputin started to fulfill those needs for these women and so they really believed that he had healed something with in them when all he had really done was fulfilled a, a very biological need that all adult human beings have but nonetheless his reputation was huge in St. Petersburg. He was using Reiki to heal people, all those kinds of things. So the Tsar and Tsarina of Russia, Nicholas II and his wife Alexandria, who was the granddaughter of Victoria. I'm the five times great granddaughter of Victoria. So there is a biological relationship I do have distantly with um, the Tsarina, who was married to Nicholas II. Now, for all intents and purposes, the Tsar Rina and the Tsar of Russia, they actually really loved each other. They had a lot of kids. They were they were rumored to be one of the only royal families in, in Europe at this time to actually share a marital bed. So, so sexually and passionately, they obviously fulfilled each other. Well, the problem was that they kept having girls. In Russia at this time, in order for the, the, the czar to really secure his power and his imp empire, even while he, while he is alive, is to produce a son to make sure that his empire, the Romanov empire, is secure. The Romanovs had been in power for about 300 years. They had produced people like Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, this was the Romanovs are one of the most powerful dynasties that our world has ever seen. And finally, their fifth child was born, Alexei, who was going to be the the um, eventual uh, heir to this Im empire. But the problem with Alexei is that he was born with hemophilia, hemophilia B, which is a blood clotting disorder. This is very common in the royal family due to a lot of incest. Now we do know that Alexei's hemophilia did come from his mother. And so Alexandria, the Tsarina, felt very guilty and of course she loved her children too to, so to see your child suffering this was a very very serious illness it still is a very serious illness although nowadays we do have a lot of more modern uh, medications to help people who contract hemophilia especially hemophilia b but for them they were constantly afraid that alexi was going to die and if alexi died then that would destroy their empire and on top of that nicholas and alexandria were getting older so the likelihood of producing even more children was getting um the, the odds were not in their favor let's let's just put it that way and so with alexi's illness this was a state secret they told none of their people none of the, the people of russia that their child their son their heir was deathly sick with hemophilia though you can go months and months and months being fine but then take a bad fall skin your knee and all of a sudden you could potentially die so that is why in some of the old videos of of this family you do see alexi playing sometimes so i do think it was an easy secret to hide because for for an, an outsider looking in they probably just saw a rambunctious little boy who would one day be the czar and so for the people in the aristocratic circles of the czar and czarina very few people knew about this maybe a few of his doctors and his mom and dad that was it well, there was a really bad episode that Alexei had, and Alexandria herself was very superstitious, was very, very religious. She was known to travel around with mystics to always, more so than most royals, be dependent upon clairvoyance, all that kind of stuff. And so through the people who were already working with Alexandria, who also knew Rasputin, a bit of networking here, um, Rasputin was called to the palace. This was in 1904. 
Rasputin walks into the room of the sick Alexei and basically does Reiki on him. Basically put lays his hands on Alexei and prays and does Reiki. And Alexei seems at this point to be healed of his hemophilia. He does a complete turnaround and is totally fine. The Tsarina, Alexandria, the mother of this child, is now besmitten by Rasputin. She believes that if he is not in their lives on a daily basis, that her precious son and heir to the Russian throne will die. So this is huge manipulation. Huge. I think from a parent's perspective, I'm not a parent, but I do think any parent would probably do whatever they could to make sure that their child was safe, even if that means moving in a very stinky, weird man. On top of this, this is also a threat to her family's power. So not only is she concerned about the life of her child, but she's also concerned about the power her family holds as the Tsar and the Tsarina. Basically, the odds were stacked against the Romanovs. Now, I do think it's quite funny. There was a guy I listened to, a professor who is his course of study is the Romanovs. And he basically said that Nicholas II nor Alexandria were the brightest bulbs. They weren't the sharpest tools in the shed. They weren't that smart. Let's just put it that way. Uh, they never should have ever been placed in a a powerful position and we do see this with the way that nicholas is governing his people he's making a lot of mistakes um he's just not the ruler that his ancestors were this might have something to do with incest i don't know or maybe they were just dumb i, I don't know but because of their perceived low level of intelligence both of them it was very easy for a malicious manipulator like Rasputin to work his way into their lives. I mean, Rasputin flat out told the Tsarina that without him, her son would die. So yeah, he, he became basically the pseudo ruler of Russia because of his control over the royal family. It is said that Rasputin basically ruled the palace, that he had free reign over the palace to come and go as he pleased. He also had free reign to the young princesses, the four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia. He had complete access to them. And many historians have made this very, very clear that there was probably inappropriate rituals if you know what i mean happening with these daughters with these little girls i don't know if the czar and the czarina the mother and father were aware of that i think they knew obviously they had they gave rasputin access to their children but were they aware that there was um some sex magic going on with these children for lack of a better a better word maybe maybe not if if they were stupid if they were not that bright then they might not have noticed that that weird things were going on with him and, and their daughters. But also, they could have had cognitive dissonance. They could have been so en enwrapped in the fact that Rasputin was healing their son that they didn't want to accept that he was actually abusing their daughters. Many people believe that Rasputin and the Tsarina had a romantic relationship as well. Some of the letters between them are very suspicious. However, I kind of lean more to this idea that they didn't. Um, I think that maybe he toyed with the Tsarina a little bit, but I don't know if they actually had. Even though the letters are very intimate, um, they can also be read as like a sweet letters back and forth between them, like that she just loved him so much like a family member. Um, we do know, however, that Rasputin did have a romantic relationship with the Tsarina's sister, and she got pregnant, and that family line is Somerset Belenoff. So, Summer, we've, we've talked about Somerset Belenoff. I used to have a video on her, but it got taken down. If you don't know who Somerset Belenoff is, you might want to go and do that research yourself because she is literally, truly the most wicked horrible human being that ever walked the face of the earth. At this point, Rasputin was definitely developing his own little cult in St. Petersburg. He was fully, fully booked. Between servicing the royal family, he became completely overworked with all of these aristocratic women 
in Russia, there was constantly a line of women outside of his apartment, his house, of women trying to get in to see Rasputin for him to service, quote unquote, service them. He also at this point started to create his own doctrine, his own scripture. So he was creating his own religion that people were literally following. Again, this reminds me a lot of the telegram personalities and characters that are out there forming these cults to this day. Very similar, similar personality types to what's happening with Rasputin. He would have these feasts with women where they would gorge themselves into gluttony and then they would go into the quote unquote back room where they would have um, uh, intimate parties. I have to be careful about saying certain words too many times because of YouTube's al algorithms, but you guys get, get my drift of what was happening in those back rooms. The crux of Rasputin's belief was that without sin, there is no life. Without sin, there is no repentance. And without repentance, there is no joy. This is a very easy way to manipulate people who are Christians because Christians don't understand what the word sin really means. I think Rasputin knew what the word sin really means, but he created this idea of people, you know, having really just indulging in, in these sadistic and, and selfish aspects of life in order to then find the redemption of God and through that find joy where we know the original definition of sin just means to miss the mark doesn't mean doing anything wrong it just means to miss the mark so we see how he's able to kind of spell cast and manipulate many many people to harness their energy their sexual energy um, in order to make himself more and more powerful it is believed that many people in russia also thought that he potentially was the second coming of jesus not quite sure if that was just an opinion of people in saint petersburg or if perhaps he is the one who started that rumor again reminds me a lot of the telegram groups there are many people on telegram claiming to be the second coming of jesus very very similar this is all the negative uh, satanic uh, polarized selfish path basically rasputin taught that sex religion and miracles were all one and the same now with that being said even though rasputin seemed to have most of russia wrapped around his little finger he did have some people who were suspicious believing he was getting too powerful believing that he was not doing things for the good of russia or the good of humanity but more or less was working for the devil at this point he started to be followed by secret police and we have records of of him going and servicing aristocratic women and going and servicing you know all sorts of people who were his quote-unquote clients then going to bathhouses with prostitutes i mean this guy was literally doing it all day long now bathhouses in russia are part of the russian culture of banya. it's called a banya and it's a russian steam bath with a wood stove that i think today can be kind of compared to a sweat lodge sweat lodges are often used especially native american practices there are sweat lodges here in atlanta I have a lot of friends who participate them in them from time to time for people to have spiritual experiences. And so the bathhouses in this regard became a place of high occultic practices where they were doing sex magic, where they were doing all sorts of things within these bathhouses where it was really, really warm. And so people were able to let go of a, basically they were coming a little bit discombobulated in their thoughts. <laughs> and so they were able to then perceive beyond the veil or so they thought they were perceiving beyond the veil and have these mystical experiences experiences and he would go to these bathhouses multiple times in a day all with different prostitutes it is often stated too in some cases especially in these bathhouses that Rasputin would basically beat the shit out of the people that were in there with him before then raping them and this was getting so he was getting more and more and more and more sadistic as time was going on there are also reports from the secret police that he was seen like literally talking to himself walking down the streets talking to himself getting crazier and crazier and crazier i don't believe he was actually getting crazier i think he knew exactly what he was doing which we're going to get to at the end of this episode when we talk about the law of one the church authorities believed at this point that rasputin was performing the devil's miracles not god's miracles and I'm going to explain this quickly because we're going to see this a lot throughout the rest of this story, which again, we'll talk more about when we get to the law of one. 
just because the church is saying that Rasputin is of the devil does not mean that the church is not of the devil. When we look at service to self groups or organizations or people, oftentimes they will attack each other. There's no honor amongst thieves and use each other in order to do- to create more dominated power. So it is my belief, because I know the church is evil, you watching this know the church is evil as well, that the church, their selfish desire for dominance and power was now being threatened by Rasputin. And so they turned on Rasputin. In one instance, it says that Rasputin was basically kidnapped and brought into a church where he was beaten with a crucifix. They also kicked his wiener in a few times, tried to end his life, tried to kill him. But Rasputin got away and, of course, ran to the Tsar and Tsarina and told on them. And these particular church authorities got exiled out of Russia. There were many attempts made on Rasputin's life. Uh, One in particular, one main attempt It was in 1914. He was stabbed by a prostitute that was hired by the church to kill him. Very disfigured. Um, I guess she was suffering from syphilis or some sort of uh, STD that caused disfiguration of, of the body. She stabbed him so hard that she was actually able to pull his intestines out. But he survived and he spent a lot of time recovering in a hospital. And as luck would have it, at this time, World War I started while Rasputin was in the hospital. Now, Rasputin kept writing to the Tsar, Nicholas II, that he should not get involved in World War I. And Rasputin was actually right about this because Nicholas II's involvement in World War I was probably the last of many stupid decisions that he had made governing his people. At first, when the, he joined the war, his people loved him and thought he was a hero for sending in the troops to fight, you know, as, uh, as Russians. And, you know, so he was really soaking in all this adulation and praise from his own people. However, unfortunately, this did turn because four million Russians were killed in the war. This caused inflation to skyrocket. This caused a lot of poverty within Russia where people could not afford to to buy bread. I mean, this is very similar to what we're going through right now in our world. But meanwhile, the Tsar and Tsarina were one of the wealthiest humans on the planet just surrounded by opulent wealth where while the people were uh, the exact opposite were starving to death many journalists at the time described saint petersburg specifically as almost like an insane asylum or a mental institution because people were so angry and so hungry they were acting in vigilante violence and acting in derangement. There definitely was a sense of the for foreboding revolution that we know is coming, the Bolkovich revolution. There's a lot of anger towards the aristocrats, towards the royal family, as they seem to be completely out of touch with what was truly happening to the people of Russia, which, my friends, they weren't wrong. They were not wrong. The, the Tsar and Tsarina were totally oblivious to to the struggles of their own people, which is very different from like Catherine the Great, one of their predecessors, who very much did a lot to help the people and was very aware of what was going on with her people. These two, though, these two were like spoiled little elitist brats who literally just could not be bothered to even pay attention to what was going on within the Russian people. It it reminds me too of like, did they not learn anything from the Habsburgs and Marie Antoinette? Like, did they not learn anything? History has a way of repeating itself. And if I were in charge, I would definitely be studying history and trying to find a way to course correct things that had happened in the past that did not work out for the betterment of humanity. But that was not the case with the Tsar and the Tsarina. They were just happy as clams in their own little gilded cage, right? Not even aware of what was going on with the people, their people, who were literally dying on the streets of starvation. At this point, after Rasputin got out of the hospital, he started to also lose his abilities. Now, I believe that, again, he was serving a fourth density negative being. He was going fourth density negative himself. And again, 
there's no honor amongst thieves, right? So sometimes these entities, these negative entities will lure people, will give them support and structure, and then will turn their back on that person to see their own sacrifice, their own death. And this is what was happening with Rasputin. He believed that he was going to be sacrificed. He knew he was going to be murdered. He just didn't know how, when, why, where. He was losing his abilities. He was losing his control over, over his disciples, I guess you could call them. People also started believing that Rasputin was a spy, perhaps a spy for the Germans, because remember, Alexandria herself was German. She was from a German family. She married into the Russian family. When she married Nicholas II, she didn't even speak Russian. And so there was always a little bit of skepticism. And we're in World War One at this moment, right? So Germans are not the, the favorite people for the Russians, as well as other people who are on the opposite side of the war. At this point, St. Petersburg also developed the nickname The Devil's Town. Um, because of Rasputin. And at this point, other aristocratic people in the area were like, we've got to get rid of this guy. Like, this guy is going to be the destruction of all of us. We have to save ourselves at this point. And this brings us to Felix Yusupov, who has historically gone down as the man to murder Rasputin, although it was a huge ploy and conspiracy amongst quite a few people. So who was this guy, this guy that killed Rasputin. He was a Russian aristocrat who was married to the Tsar's niece. He was also one of the wealthiest men in Russia. It is rumored that he was bisexual or more homosexual and that he did have relationships with Rasputin. So many people don't quite know if Rasputin's assassination was purely political or there might have been some jealousy involved as well. I think it was more political than anything. And like I said, it doesn't mean that this person that killed him was good himself or that anybody else involved in the assassination was good. No honor amongst thieves. The darkness, the service, the self-entities ent will battle each other from time to time. They'll use each other to come out on top. I don't know, though. I haven't done much look into this guy, so I, it's not fair for me to say he was bad. I have no idea. I don't even know if the Tsar and Tsarina were negatively oriented i just know that rasputin was so they got rasputin to come over to their house in the guise of like a housewarming party they brought him into the basement and told rasputin that the wife the niece of the czar was still entertaining some guests and would be down shortly they proceeded to bring out cream pastries and alcohol that had been laced with cyanide poisoning rasputin took a while to start eating but eventually he started to eat the group noticed that nothing was happening. Now, if you put a, a shit ton of cyanide into food and drink, it's going to have a rather quick effect on a person. It's if, if you poison someone a little bit over time, it will take time. But this was like they wanted him gone that night. So it was a lot of poison within this food and nothing seemed to happen. Nothing happened to Rasputin. He just didn't die. At this point, Yusupov went and grabbed a gun and started to shoot at Rasputin and physically fight him. At one point, Rasputin landed on the ground where they thought he was dead. So they went upstairs to convene to figure out what else to do. When they came back, the body was gone. How terrifying is that? And they looked out the window and Rasputin was running away in the courtyard. At that point, they started to shoot, 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 shoot until he finally hit the ground. And by died. 5 a.m., he was brought to the frigid river where they figured his body would not be discovered for a while however two days later his body surfaced after his body surfaced people started to scoop up the water around rasputin because they believed it was holy we also know from the autopsy that Rasputin technically died of drowning. So even after all that cyanide poisoning, after being shot multiple times, it was the water that killed him. At first, Rasputin was buried, but later on he was exhumed and burned. Now in the meantime though, a cult was forming in Paris, France. In the 1920s, Maria Rasputin, one of his daughters, was a lion tamer in the circuses of France, in Paris specifically. So this goes back to the Matahari story, which I will put that in the description box below as well. And while in Paris, Maria discovered a underground cult that worshipped the penis of her dead father. That's right, my friends. It seems that Felix Yusupov actually removed 
Rasputin's penis after his death. Felix Yusupov himself ended up in Paris, France, in exile after the Bolkovich Revolution. So that's how his lingam, we'll say, ended up in France. Maria took ownership of the penis. I mean, how freaking weird is that? I don't. That's disgusting. And she kept it in her possessions until the 1970s, where she ended up selling it for $8,000 about um, to a man because she needed money. The penis is now at the Museum of Erotica in St. Petersburg. Now, it is believed that the cult that had his lingam um, did very weird occult rituals with it and also would take pieces off of it to ingest. They believed that Rasputin's lingam carried very powerful magical and mystical fertility rites as well as rites into higher consciousness. Now many people believe that this is false, that the, the lingam in question at the museum is nothing more than a cow's wiener. I don't know. I've never seen, never looked at a cow's wiener before, never thought about it. It is a rather large wiener. Rasputin had about 12 inches on him, which to me sounds incredibly painful. Um, but And it does look human, even though it looks gross, it looks human. Um, and I do think that that might be propaganda because I personally believe they're still using that sucker in, uh, in their own occult practices. Now, there has been speculation in 2004, a documentary was released uh, where they believe that MI6 might have been also involved in the assassination of Rasputin because there was a shot in the forehead that looked like it was very much a, um, a gunshot from a trained sniper. Again, there's no honor amongst thieves. I don't really think it matters who took Rasputin out because I do believe it was two forces on the dark side trying to one-up each other for more power. Now, with that being said, the Law of One, the raw material, does have some words to say about Rasputin, which I find to be very, very fascinating and might lead to a deeper conversation on a different video. So without further ado, let's see what the Law of One has to say about Rasputin. All right, you guys, let's look at what the Law of One has to say about Rasputin. Now, after I finished doing my research on Rasputin, I, of course, was very curious about the trajectory of Rasputin's soul. If you've been on this channel for a while, you know that we have spoken about the Law of One, the, the negative polarity versus the light polarity. We also know that there are about 50% of humans on this earth right now that are considered to be organic portals that don't have souls. They're just used by the negative entities. The, those are a lot of your narcissists. And so I went through this um, back and forth in my head over whether Rasputin was an organic portal or whether he was negative polarity or whether he was actually positive polarity, but just misunderstood and confused by us. So the first thing I did was I went to the Cassiopeian board and I will read you what the Cassiopeians had to say about Rasputin. Now, just a note, if you don't know anything about the law of one or the Cassiopeians, it's too much for me to get into that in this video, but I will link videos down in the description box below that we have done in the past regarding this work. Um, so if, if, if that is something that's confusing for you, please go and check those videos out. Nonetheless, let's first look at the Cassiopeians. Well, an example I can think of is Rasputin, who is actually named in the raw session as a sold being who chose service to self orientation and polarization. So he was not an organic portal. He was a sold person. He had a soul. There is the process of polarization and having completed the lessons as factors that determine which way you are going. There is also the subject to conscious versus unconscious polarization, which is not the same as intelligence or advanced being. So those who do choose the service to self-polarity are those who have completed the lessons and also who have achieved the necessary state to hold a higher frequency for the expression of the service to self principle. The situation with Hitler was a bit different from what I remember. It seems what he attempted to do was to activate his higher centers 
without the activation of the lower ones, whatever that means. I can only speculate that he tried to tap into the so-called intelligent energy or maybe skip lessons and his soul could not support the effects of it leading him to be extremely confused and damaging his soul. Hence, he is now in the state of sleep and recovery. Rasputin, on the other hand, seems he was able to achieve this state in which he could activate all these centers, whatever that means, and at the same time, choose or resonate more with the service to self-polarity, meaning he was aware of what was going on and he was conscious of what he was doing. Yes, yeah, so we're not going to get too much into Hitler. Uh, if you are curious about what they mean with Hitler, I've known about this for a while now, but it's a little too complicated to talk about. You can get the raw books yourself and see what raw has to say about Hitler. So basically, Rasputin was more menacing than Hitler was because he knew what he was doing. There was no confusion. And with the case of, of Hitler, this is why it's so important. So many people try to skip. They try to leapfrog through spirituality they try to skip certain lessons and they don't really start at the foundation and beginnings of spirituality which is extremely dangerous um as you can sell with what happened to hitler so um that's another example of why you should always start at the beginning never try to leapfrog because leapfrogging to the end is is an ego right which is part of the service of self negative polarity so let's go ahead and look and see what raw has to say about this and so this is coming from the, the raw material the law of one book one all right and so we're gonna go from page 117 and this was from session 11 on january 28th of 1981 question is there anyone in our history who is commonly known who went to a fourth density self-service or negative type of planet or any who will go there now it's interesting because if you if you're familiar with the law of one Ra doesn't name many people like Ra will not give out names of people that he gives clues or they it's a it's a group of people they give clues so the fact that he's actually going to give us some names is quite interesting here i am Ra. the number of entities thus harvested is small however a few have penetrated the eighth level which is only available from the opening of the seventh through the sixth Penetration into the eighth or intelligent infinity levels allows a mind body spirit complex or a human being to be harvested if it wishes at any time space during that cycle. So to harvest negative that why he's saying the percentage is small to harvest negative is because it's actually harder to harvest to the negative polarity than it is to harvest to light it's in order to positive positive to, to, to harvest positive or in the light you have to be 51 percent service to others so you can have 49 percent of you that's a complete asshole but as long as 51 percent of you is in service to others and has empathy and compassion you're pretty good with making that choice of going to the light however to harvest negative you have to be like 94 95 percent service to self this is why a lot of these people on the path of service to self or the negative path the satanic path typically do things like cannibalism um all sorts of other things that i can't say on this video because of youtube but you guys know what i'm talking about that's why they go to an extreme so question are any of these people known in history of our planet by name? I am Ra. We will mention a few. The one known as Terrace Bulba, the one known as Genghis Khan, and the one known as Rasputin. Now, I've covered Genghis Khan on this channel before. I will place that video down in the description box below unless it got deleted. I'll have to double check that. YouTube has taken down quite a few of my videos, so if, if Genghis Khan is still available, I will place that video down in the description box as well. Genghis Khan, so what they're saying is Taurus Bulba, which I have not covered and I will cover if you guys want me to, Genghis Khan and Rasputin are three people who are on planet Earth that we would know that did go to a fourth density negative planet. They graduated, they were so evil that they were able to graduate to fourth density negative. So they are up in the upper realms of the negative entities at this point. Question, how did they accomplish this? Was it necessary for them to accomplish this? I am raw. All of the aforementioned entities were aware through memory of Atlantean understanding having to do with the use of various centers of mind, body, spirit, complex energy influx in attaining the gateway to an intelligent infinity. So these people 
remembered their past lives in Atlantis. They remembered. Now, remember what was happening in, in Atlantis was both good. It was the same thing that's happening now, a battle between light and dark. The darkness went out in Atlantis, though. So these people were obviously karmically connected to Atlantis and had full memory of all of the occult magic that they were doing in Atlantis and were able to use that to their own selfish services in this life. Question, did this enable them to do what we refer to as magic? Could they do paranormal things while they were incarnated? I am wrong. This is correct. The first two entities mentioned made little use of these abilities consciousness. So uh, Tyrus Bulba and Genghis Khan were had subconscious memories of their occultic magic from Atlantis. So they were doing things more instinctually. Whereas Rasputin, he's going to tell you, Rasputin actually had full control. So, however, they were bent single mindedly upon service to spell self, sparing no effort and personal discipline to double, redouble, and so empower this gateway. So, see what he said there? There was no discipline. They were single mindedly service to self. So, check that with yourself. You know, I've said many, many times before that part of the foundation of spirituality is exercise. And I get a lot of people getting mad about that. That's a selfish thing. You, you have no excuse. You have no excuse. You, you can go for a 30 minute walk. That is foundational for exercise. So if you are not disciplined and you are carrying on in spirituality without having any type of discipline, you are going down a very, very dangerous path. Okay. So that, let me read that again. because it's very important. I am Rob. This is correct. The first two entities mentioned made little use of these abilities consciously. However, they were bent single-mindedly upon service to self, sparing no efforts in personal discipline to double, redouble, and so empower this gateway. The third was a conscience, a conscience adept and also spared no efforts in the pursuit of service to self. Very selfish people, okay? Question, where are these three entities now? I am raw. These entities are in the dimension known to you as four. Therefore, the space-time continua are not compatible. An approximation of the space-time locus of each would not net no actual understanding. Each choose a chose each chose a fourth density planet, which was dedicated to the pursuit of the understanding of the law of one through the service to self. One in what you would know as the Orion group. Okay. Anyway, I won't get into more of that because the space time continuum, all that kind of stuff is really hard for humans to understand. That's what we're all saying. It's hard to explain how that transfer happens because we're in time space instead of space time. All right. Who went to the Orion group? I am Ra, the one known as Genghis Khan. What does he presently do there? What is his job? or occupation. I am raw. This entity serves the creator in its own way. Is it impossible for you to tell us precisely how he does the service? This is funny, you guys. I am raw. It is possible for us to speak on this query. However, we use any chance we may have to reiterate the basic understanding learning that all beings serve the creator. The one you speak of as Genghis Khan at present is incarnated in a physical light body, which has the work of decimating material of thought control to those who are what you may call crusaders. He is, as you would term this entity, a shipping clerk. <laughs> that is what's so hysterical about the fourth density negative, because pecking orders are all, any type of pecking order, and as we said earlier in this video, any type of pecking order where there is an elite and a lower, that's all negative oriented. So all these people here on planet Earth right now who are currently going negative, like the Hillary Clintons, the people who are in pursuit, consciously with the soul, in pursuit of the satanic or service to self path, when they get to the next world, when they go fourth density negative, they're going to be on the lowest rung. So they're going to be like shipping clerks. I find that so funny. We're fourth density positive. We're in a social membrane complex where we're all equal. All right, question. What do the Crusaders do? I am raw. The Crusaders move in their chariots to conquer planetary mind, body, spirit, social complexes before they reach the stave of achieving social memory. So basically, Genghis Khan, as a shipping clerk, is probably one of the fourth density beings that are bringing 
the influence, the black magic spells of the uh, powers that be and communicating it back and forth with the higher level, the fifth density of the negative, right? Because we know if you've, if you've seen our episodes with Mr. Fox, you know that the fourth density service is self-candidates. The people on this earth that are candidates to go fourth density negative are constantly using divination to speak with higher level density negative beings. And so Genghis Khan is like the little secretary. That's hysterical. All right. Okay, so let me see if we can find any more. Um, so that's basically all they say about um, Rasputin. I'm making sure there's nothing else because I don't want to keep going and get into more topics here. Law of One, though, that is in my Amazon affiliate link if you want to get the book for yourself. So basically, Rasputin, just to sum it up, he was a person with a soul, just like you and me. He was not an organic person a portal he had full memory of his life in atlantis and all the occultic stuff he learned there and he performed that here in this life everything he did was of service to self he was trying he was consciously going negative he wanted to go negative that's why we see all the sadism the perversions the um bloodlust the cannibalism the orgies all that stuff comes from this path to the dark side basically in the pursuit of the negative polarity all right, you guys, please join us today on Aquarius Rising Africa, where we are going to be speaking about this more in depth um, with this weird wiener cult, as well as what the law of one has to say and what um, you guys think and what we all think about this character of Rasputin. I will end on this, though. In the beginning, I talked about the song Rasputin done by the disco band in the late 70s and my thoughts that it is weird that no one I know who was alive during that time remembers this song. But then all of a sudden in the 2000s, it becomes a hot popular song. Well, my feeling, and this is just my opinion, is that this is a time, a time leap. I feel like that the power of Rasputin was so potent because he knew what he was doing, that the powers that be on this, in this earth are still trying to channel him because they know he is in fourth density right now, which is a higher density than third. And so we know that they do spell casting through music. And I believe, it is my opinion, that this song is to harvest the energy of Rasputin. That is just my opinion. And I don't believe it was actually popular back in the 70s when they said it was. I think they went back and changed things in time leaping to make it popular now. For, for this time of great friction in our world where the dark and the light are going head to head. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, you guys, uh, please leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. And we will see you on Aquarius Rising Africa this morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time for a live show where we're going to also be discussing in greater detail this enigmatic creature known as Rasputin.